Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth episode of the Not Star Podcast. Uh, today we have with us Akshay Yadav. He is a principal product manager uh, in the US, based out of San Francisco. He works in a company called Audible Magic, which works at the intersection of you know the most complicated as well as most fascinating industries: music, uh, IP, and tech. And uh, that's and nothing more about it within the podcast. Uh, there's an interesting aspect to his. life uh, about his passion around waste management uh, which is extremely counterintuitive for a tech guy uh, based out of uh, the us i think this is like the reverse of his story he did his not for profit action in india and then moved on to the us uh, so we'll know a little more about that uh, his not for profit based out of bangalore uh, and how he went about it uh, he's given a couple of tedx talks that you might want to uh, refer as well Uh, so without further ado, we'll dive right into the episode. I think the first thing that we wanted to, we both were very curious, right? Is the way you uh, your current LinkedIn summary, right? It reads decreasing conflicts in the music industry and social media, right? I think that's a, I mean, it encapsulates I think a lot of the work you do and your uh, company does. Uh, but we were really curious and we wanted to just understand from you, like what yeah. does that mean? from a company standpoint and like both your work absolutely uh, yeah um so i mean i think a, a brief context will be appropriate at this stage um to just you know talk about the evolution of how you know music has evolved um you know in the last couple of decades um the way music was always you know published and monetized historically was through you know physical assets which is cassettes or cds um you know and stuff like that um all through live performances increasingly through live performances but in the last couple of decades um last two decades like with the increasing social media um now there is there was this whole new channel of how music was distributed as well so we have the spotifys of course but we also have you know the facebooks and the soundclouds um and this is a monetization source of so my specific company um is at the nexus of um user generated content which is called ugc um user generated content as well as the music industry and it looks at this specific nexus to um you know bring insight into the attribution as well as you know the licensing for music and um, you know we are a global company um so license further background is licenses in the music industry are extremely complex because you know it, there are s- from starting from the artists to the publishers to the rights owners there are different you know stages as which as to which who owns the rights to you know which song and then the original versus the cover version versus um you know remixed version there are so many nuances to the entire industry um and all of this feeds into how how can you how can you justify attribution such that you know attribution should ideally be the core of this entire industry uh, you know the, the core of payments because you want to pay those you know particular labels or those particular rights holders who are being streamed the most or who are who are being you know shared on social media the most right so um this goes into so let's just look at the live use case um, you know gagan uploads a specific video onto facebook um, you know or you know is doing uh, you know having a specific um service which is shared on zoom which uses a specific background score now and he is using that uh if if it were just used for non profit purposes it would be perfectly fine but like these days social media is being monetized and there is ad revenue generated from all of this content that is uploaded right um now when platforms are generating revenue from this uh, you know user generated content that is uploaded to their websites it brings a very interesting you know uh dilemma as to who who owns this ad revenue is it is it a facebook so suppose you upload a specific um you know video which has you know corresponding audio to it and specific music to it should facebook be paying some part of this to the you know labels the rights owners and the artists themselves um and does it you know follow all the regulations so that's where it's at the interface of these two giant industries where my company lies um and we're not a very big company um you know we're we're a 70 size organization but 
essentially what we do is uh, you know fingerprinting of these uh, you know all of the user generated content for, uh, on these websites so that we can um, you know uh, provide services for compliance licensing as well as attribution um, such that you know there is there is a steady flow of revenue from you know these platforms to the actual mm -hmm. In the absence of which there is a lot of conflict, there may be a lot of lawsuits from the music industry, which are thrown onto the platforms. Hey, you did not have the rights to share this. How are you monetizing this? And then these lawsuits just keep going on and on and on. So, like in the in the absence, uh, I mean, we are trying to alleviate that, such that you know these conversations don't need to happen over lawsuits themselves, and it can there can be a peaceful uh, you know uh, information exchange over this. So some of our customers are T series in India, um, you know, which which has you know a lot of the music rights and stuff like that, and, and that's on one side. On the other side is the Facebooks, which is our um, you know biggest customer, and SoundCloud, which is our biggest customer as well. So really trying to navigate this entire environment, um, you know, on both sides of uh, of a two side marketplace. So I think uh, I think what's interesting is you mentioned the complexities in say uh, an advanced and a mature market like the US. Right, I think it's just I don't know, like uh, an order of magnitude much more complex in a place like India. I was actually having this conversation with a with a podcasting platform, uh, not a podcasting platform, but an audio platform. That's that's a better description of it. And the only reason they haven't gone into music, like they don't have music as a category, is this that they don't want to slow themselves down at the yes. stage that they're in. And I think they're pretty big in India, and like. But th that's the point, and I think that, that speaks to the complexity that exists in India. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's not easy there as well, but I think just India and the bureaucracy and just uh, the I, the you know IP laws that we have yeah. is much more complex here. So uh, when we are seeing your profile, right, consistently over like the last five six years, you have been working as a PM uh, and a business leader in the B two B space primarily, yeah. right? So that like. What pushes you to remain in that space, especially when there is so much happening on the B two C end, correct? Yeah. And like you want to impact the user straight for, in a straightforward way, right? So, like, what pushes you on a daily basis to kind of continue in that space? Absolutely. So it's it's a good question. Um, you know, if you look at how these spaces have been evolving, uh, like there are a couple of reasons, right? Like, first is. Um, you know, what's currently happening in the B2B space, that's one factor. The second is the size and the scale of the organizations. Um, you know, that's the second factor. Um, and third is the nature of the role itself. And I think these are the nuances which separate B2B from B2C as well. Um, so let's take them one by one, right? So um, the first is what's happening in the B2B space. Historically, B2B was more relationship driven where you know execs in one company are talking with the execs in the other company and it's um, it's not about getting the best product to the market as it is about um, really these relationships and then the SLAs for them um, however what we've been seeing in the last you know five six years especially is there's a massive disruption going on so even for example zoom like what was the predecessor for zoom it was you know Cisco Webex um, you know and uh, the popular tools that we know, um, you know, were Skype, which was B2C platform, but a, a vast chunk of these applications lay in the enterprise space, which is the internal communication tool within the organizations. The biggest disruption that, you know, and Slack is the same as well, right? Like there were internal communication tools, which now Slack has taken over. So the disruption that's happening right now is the B2C concept, which was you know, get the best product in the market, make it a really cool product, make it really easy to sell and, you know, focus on the user experience, individual user experience rather than the corporate, you know, engagement. That has been increasingly the theme in the last, you know, five, six years, maybe even 10 years. And that's why there's a significant amount of disruption that's happening in the B2B space. So it's a very exciting time to be in the B2B space. Um, so that's number one. The second is the you know, scale of the organization. So when you see, when you look at the B2B versus B2C, you'll realize that, you know, most of the B2C products, um, it's, it's very hard to get into the B2C market because you achieve a certain level of scale, um, you know, when you enter the B2C. So for example, it would have been really exciting to be in the foundational team of, the, of WhatsApp. But once WhatsApp has achieved scale, um, you know, as a 
WhatsApp now has 50 product managers, suppose. Um, you can have a functional ownership, which is, you know, on one specific aspect of WhatsApp, but you will not get, you know, complete ownership of the end-to-end -end experience. So that's the other part of it, which, you know, a personal preference, which was really to try to, you know, see the entire breadth of, you know, um, the ownership that I can have. Um, and it's only in the B2B space where you have profit and loss, which is the PNL tied to product management as well. So there is a fine line and some B2B companies have this more pronounced than others where the product manager is more of a general manager and owns the uh, you know, profit and loss and you know, really trying to understand why is this product not working in the market. So it's when you think of the CEO of the product that's more prominent in the B2B space than in the B2C space. And again, not all of B2B, but it, you know, in significant portions of B2B. Um, and the third, which is the nature of the role, which I spoke about just briefly, but you know, just the ownership aspect of it, um, you know, and B2B is never really B2B. B2B is B2B2C because the customers of these, you know, organizations are individual users themselves, right? There is, um, there's always, it's, it's further upstream. So the impact that you have, the scale that can be much, you know, higher as well. So um, yeah, all of these three reasons are, you know, they were pretty compelling for me to, you know, keep to this space. Um, so that's why I'm here. So when you are like thinking about any like uh, idea for that matter, right? They, I'm sure ki it doesn't come strike you immediately, right? Uh, and actually the good products, the scale products aren't always incremental. You have to do something of a path breaking thing because that's where invention is. Who knows like car is the best thing which you have invented, right? So like what do you, that imagination, that agility, right? to build uh, absolutely disruptive and tangential products, right? Which can, which the human mind doesn't even think of. Like, how do you go about doing that? That whole process and your thought process behind it. Um, yeah, it's a two part question because I, I think once the, the thing I think you're focusing on is the disruption and, you know, disruptive products. Um, at the outset, I think very few product managers would say in reality that I want to make a disruptive product, right? Like, because it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, video creators saying he, we, we want to make a viral video, right? Like you, you don't talk like virality is something which is very hard to predict and it's got very deep connotations and relationships with, you know, the psychology of human beings and what really becomes viral. Timing is a very important issue. Context is a very important thing. Um, but there are some North stars, which is, you know, simplicity, ease of adoption and, you know, the actual problem that you're trying to address and most importantly, the resources that you have at hand um, you know, to actually, you know, go and implement this idea. So um, being in Silicon Valley and, you know, having seen, you know, companies such as, you know, Tesla and um, Lucid Motors, for example, you just give the example of cars, right? Um, there is disruption happening on the side of electric vehicles right now. In fact, um, you know, Tesla actually expedited the entry of electric vehicles by almost 10 years or almost a decade and it got these electric vehicles, vehicles sooner into the market. But the incumbency was, or the incumbent focuses were extremely strong just because of the uh, you know, nature of how, and the efficiencies of scale, which had already been achieved with the historic market. Um, and there had to be something which was very different with respect to, you know, the coolness of the brand on one aspect, the cost is the second aspect, the distribution of these cars, the third aspect, maintenance and, you know, constant evolution on strategy. Um, so there is some method to the madness and it's just not about some idea that comes into your mind, right? Like when you want to bring disruption, the amount of investment that has gone into Tesla to really fund the core research and development and the actual core technology of it, um, you know, L5 automation is not easy at all, right? So um, having those aspects as well baked into the entire product, it's, it's a very long journey. And, you know, the roadmaps are made almost five to seven years in advance. So it's like whenever you're thinking of doing something so disruptive, like you you have to plan so much farther in advance. Um, and still you have to wait for a long time for failures to keep, 
like building up and not be dissuaded by them because you know what you're looking for is not immediate adoption but something far down the lane um and that's why like keeping to true to you know what you really want to believe is really essential um but i will like and this is that's why i said this is a two part question because this only addresses the products which are meant to be disruptive products but you know everything doesn't need to be you know disruptive at the outset right like what we are trying to do or what the hist- historical way that we have seen tech shape up is constant unbundling rebundling of you know services and features right for example uh, you, you know the uh, are you familiar with craigslist and you know in the us basically craigslist is a website where historically you could even you know um have people stay in your house you could offer services locally you could basically you know find your soulmate you could find restaurants you could do everything on this one website called craigslist which was actually a very uh, you know valuable website and a va- valuable business model till you know even 2010 2011 um and what we then saw is basically unbundling of craigslist and rebundling of these things into a company like airbnb which basically only focused on the area of shared housing right or um you know tinder or you know dating apps like that which only focused on another aspect uh, or you know communication which was you know basically on on something else so it was constant unbundling rebundling of these things which which the tech industry is you know constantly doing simplifying things making the user experience you know better and of course the biggest driving factor in all of this is increased processing power um the compute power has increased significantly on all of the you know devices so basically we can do more with much lesser space that we have as a product manager there are two aspects to building anything one is like yes. the analytical aspect wherein you improve a certain thing basis data and the other is your imagination and what you have read maybe from other domains or yeah which you know right this has worked somewhere or all of that and then you might want to try it so how does that process come in absolutely i think it's just um you know and steve jobs used to say this and he like and elon musk as well like and these two people are you know meant to be the north stars for you know understanding what the customer is but if you see common patterns in um you know different people who have achieved some level of fame in you know bringing these disruption is their capacity to you know read from various different sources and just it, I, i think steve jobs um used to talk about this you know very highly of the fact that how a design course that he had taken um which was at that time not something which was you know sexy cool or you know serving a specific um you know end but it just piqued his curiosity and you know same with elon musk before he became elon musk like he was a very voracious reader he used he used to have a great appetite for books and there was no there was nothing which was really out of bounds or which he said oh like this particular domain psychology why should i read about psychology that's not related to product management like in the end you have to really be curious as a human being because you can find inspiration in so many different things and like the more that you consume you start seeing patterns in things um and you start seeing re- like it's a common theme itself right all of the very old age old adages actually come true and you know i use them in as reference to my first principles in product management too right like so for for example begin with the end in mind right as a product manager if you don't if you are only about starting ideas and not about finishing them like you will never you will never build a product <laughs> you will always start building new features but you will never finish building them so always beginning with the end in mind you know so uh, there are and there are so many different you know principles like this which see themes across so many varied re- like because in the end it's it's just same basic principles which you are all operating through so being curious about them being curious about learning um, from different resources i think if if nothing else it it may you'll just realize there's another adage there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come right um so it's you, you may just be at the right place at the right time and that's when you get this innovative idea that you're talking about which may be a disruption i, I think uh, i think that was the like apart from the zoom calls uh, timing i think it was a perfect segue to one of the things that we wanted to touch upon right 
i think a part of your i think a big part of your journey so far has been uh, you know this uh, this persona and this this work more importantly that you've done around waste management right uh, you've been called the the garbage man right which sounds like a it's like a superhero name so the, <laughs> <laughs> the the question essentially is uh, like what's the origin story for this for, for the garbage van and if you could just walk us through that i think this there's, there's so much to unpack there we would want to know uh, about that sure um you know i i think the origin story has multiple different entry points like it depends where you want to start so um where where i feel is the right origin story is you know i i was very passionate about environmental sustainability and still i'm very passionate about environmental sustainability and i think the roots of it may be in my childhood so i i spent my childhood in darjeeling and from my house window i could see the kanchenjunga peak um and every day on my walk to the school um i i used to see that peak and it was basically tranquil nature which um you know i it it like that perfect idea like or that perfect image always you know deep rooted somewhere in my mind so there was always um you know an interest in that um and when we think of environmental sustainability um you know like when when i was thinking of making this change i was already um you know volunteering for lots of organizations while i was in bangalore and was working as you know a telecom engineer um and there was i was following popular media too and a lot of the things you know which was you know on popular media when you um you know follow such topics a lot of the content is derived and inspired from the western um you know focus areas such as um you know solar um you know power and you know a lot of things like that right so when i i i, I i started volunteering with that perspective that i will be contributing towards environmental sustainability in a way but once i started volunteering on the field i realized that the issues that india had ground up were significantly different from you know solar energy microgrids like and of course like it started to increase in relevance but um it was a whole different set of topics whereas what the common man was really facing was you know garbage on every locality and roadside and it was it like the the actual reality of that was very different and that was where as i started volunteering more i realized that that was something that i could contribute towards um bangalore was a great place to get started on that um because bangalore had a very dedicated group of you know volunteers and um you know citizen activists per se who had started this journey already um so i plugged into that initiative and um you know became a part of an organization called solid waste management round table um and i was leading the initially i was leading the volunteering group per se and like it was a very tacky name green commandos where we had a, like and when we were going about it the only way to broadcast all of this was through google groups and we still have very active google groups in bangalore um with special interest focus areas um so it was quite incidental that i you know got into waste management but you know once i understood the breadth of the problem and the fact that um you know we were essentially like what in like in india what we have you know recently become uh, uh, you know uh, what has increasingly become more and more prevalent is find a piece of land far away from the city take all the garbage irrespective of you know whether it is sorted or not go and dump on this land and this land is not in an isolated place there are lots of neighboring villages and everything around it and it's not that the landfill is scientific there is mostly a tarpaulin sheet that is sometimes you know just saving this garbage from and the rainwater from going to the system i when i saw what that reality was and you know i i i still feel that you know if you really want to transform your image of what civilization has come to any person if they visit a landfill site in india they will immediately be transformed to just understand where the garbage goes um so start researching more and it was it was basically i realized that it was a very important issue um no one throws their or at least till a while back no one threw the newspapers at, right like in the garbage when i was a kid my parents used to send me to a kirana store to sell the newspapers you know so that you get some amount but we sell we throw everything else um and there is an inherent value in things right like so when you look at the whole loop and how to close this loop there's an inherent value in everything um in fact 
there's a quote which had inspired me a lot back then which was what is garbage garbage is just energy in the wrong in a in a wrong form in the wrong place in the wrong time that's that's what garbage is because if you see on earth there is no real garbage there is nothing called garbage because everything which is an output of a certain system is an input towards certain uh, a different system so when i started looking at the social dynamics of this you know the waste pickers the way that they were involved and you know um the movement towards you know incineration and all of those things and you know the fact that there is certain element of mobilizing and informing people as to what what does it entail that really inspired him to contribute more and more and it was it was quite coincidental that you know once i started working in 2011 um was when we i, I don't even we we have become so short term that i don't know whether people even remember this but in 2011 all of landfill sites in bangalore shut down and for almost two weeks there was no garbage to take anywhere and there was close to you know I, i don't even remember how many tons of garbage lying on the streets there was an actual danger of outbreak of um, plague on the streets um and that's when it's really we, we started going towards you know policy movements and you know in, in helping policy become more decentralized and you know decentralized processing um and really mobilizing more and more people to get this vision into a reality of decentralized uh, uh, you know waste management so that's where it started from it's i i feel myself quite lucky that i reached the stage where i co-founded an organization i'm still associated with the organization and um i i yeah i i also help them um, you know for the non-profit wing i help sponsor these uh, you know salaries of three employees so that has been my constant engagement since i've left there but um you know essentially if you see a problem somewhere around you like it's very easy for us to turn our back and live our co- like lives as if it doesn't matter to us but um what really brought about the transformation in me was to realize that you know it's this problem is not going to go away in fact as we keep going further and further this problem is just going to get bigger and bigger and it was just an opp- opportunity for me to plug myself at that time to help in whatever way i could and you know thankfully it, it was something that i i have been very passionate about and that's why the interest has sustained and my engagement has sustained but you can't plan for such things um you know such things you just have to be aware at such times and opportunities come in front of you and just somehow be bold enough to take um you know a step which might not be a very conventional step um and see where it goes just because you believe that it could lead to somewhere so uh, akshay the question was ki when you started this right when you go founded um, this waste management organization was there a thought of building a business model around it as well and to scale it like as an entrepreneur or was it always like a social service of sorts um the organization started with a social service um so my co-founder nalini um she had worked in this industry for a significant duration and she had started the organization from the perspective of you know policy advocacy for waste pickers <clears throat> who have been involved in this industry for you know the longest possible time and getting some social security and identity for them because the waste pickers have always been one of the most vulnerable um, you know sources of pop- or vulnerable populations in india um they typically are you know even born in quite often and it's not always but born in houses you know um in in house birth themselves so right from not having an identity card to you know not having any rights most people look at them as beggars whereas you know if you look at the entire ecosystem it's a very complex ecosystem which um is you know for good or bad measure even tied very closely to the um the entire vote bank and you know the way politics is run in this country so when i understood that complexity um or started getting exposed to that complexity i realized that you know that was one aspect of it which was you know getting the rights for these waste pickers which was the focus of hustlers up till then but the opportunity was that there was no single organization which was doing waste management in the right way um in bangalore at that time um so the opportunity was to offer and you know organizations in bangalore up till then were only offering um recyclable waste collection service which is a part of the problem but it's not the complete problem so the 
innovation at that time was twofold. First was offer total waste management services. So all like every entity that we associate with, we will take care of all of your garbage and the onus is on us to find the right supply chain to ensure that it's getting processed well. And the second was in the business model itself, which was uh, rather than having a bulk payment, which is given to the end of the, at the end of the month to contractors or whatever, there's a variable pay involved, which really ensures that, you know, different, basically different streams of waste have different values associated with them. And if we make the end customer informed about that and measure garbage on a daily basis as to how much are you producing, you are incentivized to segregate better and, uh, you know, do uh, be more responsible. And it's also better for the environment, it's better for the business, everything. So these are twofold innovations that we really took and we started going out to the market. And we were very lucky that this was um, embraced by a lot of communities because it's a major pain point in this country to deal with the garbage contractors who are not rational players at all. In fact, it's through this, I had so many life learnings through this experience that, you know, in India, it's basically, you know, it's not a free market in most places, traditional markets. It's basically might is right, like geographical distributions, like this is your territory, this is my territory, don't come into my territory at all, otherwise consequences. I used to get phone calls with death threats saying, tomorrow, if you come here, we will actually break your hands and legs. We, are, we know your vehicle number, we know everything. And they used to act upon some of these things, but the customers who were, and this, this may be the part where product management also come in, the customers, the end users who were in these apartment complexes or these corporates who were our end customers, they were constantly pushing for us. They were just like, nope, this is the best quality of service that we have seen. This is the first time that we can actually engage in a dialogue with our garbage contractor and we can actually understand what they are doing. It was a complete black box till now. Um, so we want to continue uh, in this happening. And there was a very active citizen group, which was, you know, uh, backing us up and, you know, driving more towards innovation. So that's the reason why with those strong foundations, Hasudala still exists. Um, it has expanded as well into multiple cities and, uh, you know, Nalni has, you know, really made it into an, an organization which is of national significance rather than, you know, only, you know, something that's operating in Bangalore. Nalni and Shekhar as well, uh, who joined after I left. I'm very curious to know what did, what did you mean when you said ki they also actioned it <laughs> upon Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's there's a sad connotation to it because, you know, in the end, a, a well-educated person like me um, can work in the waste management industry, but, you know, in the end, I am not the vulnerable population, right? The vulnerable people are the people who work for us. So they suffered so much right and um there's this person who got his first job in his life you know because of associating with us his name was lothfer and his name is lothfer and like his entire electricity to his community was cut off for six months like there were times when his vehicle was stopped they were roughed up tires were punctured everything uh, there were so many adversities and every time i used to go to lothfer and i used to be like lothfer you know, you have the option to back out of this whenever it gets too uncomfortable, right? And Rothfer was just like, um, yes, but this is the first time that someone is fighting for us. And um, that is something that I can never let go of. So I will go to wherever I have to go to make this happen. So yeah, it's like, it, it was the power of people who were neglected for such a long time that, um, you know, and the love and the support that really kept us going and is keeping us going until now. So um, yeah, it's, there are many hardships, you know, like, and average people, um, you know, who stay in apartments, who get these services from these people just don't understand the dynamics behind the scenes as to what's really happening. But it goes back to customer empathy, product management, everything, you know, is including the same thing, which is life as to, you know, empathize with the, you know, people as to what, what's the problem they're facing. And then, you know, try to understand what are the real challenges that you're building so that you're actually building, you know, something which is of value um, rather than something which is just, uh, you know, there to make or justify your own or get your revenue and salary for the next year or something like that. In fact, a short, like, uh way in which you can tell our audience on how if someone wants to do social service on sites right of any sort right? or any scale right how do you uh, recommend one should go about it 
short. You mean for social service in general or social service in general, like it can be as small as teaching yeah. someone or doing something which is which impacts the society outside of their work yeah. as a side project, right? Now, how does a young professional in 20 or 30s go about doing that? Someone who doesn't have any absolutely what do you recommend? How to go um, yeah, I I used to have many people who used to talk to me about this in India and um, you know um, my only advice to everyone was you're not going to wake up someday and realize what is the purpose of your life right like it never works out like that you have to try nine thousand things and out of those 999 things you will try and you'll be like hmm, you know what like it's either reached a certain space or I don't think I can add unique value to this but there is this one thing which will, you know, continue and you will be able to keep building on to that and, you know, really reach a place where you suddenly have become an expert. And the word expert is used very loosely in India. Like one year after into my experience into social enterprise, people are calling me an expert in waste management. And I'm just like, I'm a telecom engineer. <laughs> I have really no idea. But, you know, working on the ground had given me enough insights into you know, what were the real challenges. Um, so my only advice would be, you know, never like always explore things, you know, be curious. And this ties to what we were talking about product management earlier about what's the next innovative thing, right? Like be very open to learning and be very open to getting your hands dirty, right? That's the most, there are people who are walkers and there are people who are talkers. You can keep talking, 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 but unless you really complement that with some walking on the ground, and get real experience, you know, it's, it's just very hard to sit back and philosophize about life and get to a right answer as to, you know, what do you want to do? Like you have to, the onus is on each individual to figure out how can we contribute best. And the only way that we can do that is by trying out different things. Um, so if you see a cause close to you that you feel that you're touched by, um, be open to being touched by causes and problems around you. Most of us are conditioned, especially in India, right? Like we see so much of adversity around us. We see so many problems around us. A very straightforward coping mechanism is, you know, we just normalize and you just like, Chalta hai yaar. Matlab, you know, people have been suffering. This has, these are issues which have always, but once you start, you know, even showing a little bit of interest. So the gateway for me was one day I just followed my garbage you know, that I produced, you know, for just three or four kilometers, I saw and I realized, oh man, like there are so many different stop points, you know, from my house, it goes to here, it goes to here. And at the fourth place, when I reached, I, re I saw that there were waste pickers there. And of course, like this was before I had, you know, joined this particular industry. And I realized that there, I, I saw that there was a guy uh, who was a waste picker um, and like, of course, they want to look for recyclables at that, um, you know, just so that they can sell and make a living. And I saw that person put his hand into garbage and it was a very graphic scene, but when he took out his hand, his hand was bleeding because of course we throw broken glass and everything into garbage. We throw, we pack everything together and just throw it. Right. And that person, like he saw it and like, he did not have any means he, he can't, he, he does not know how to go into a hospital or whatever. Um, so he's looking through more garbage to see if there's any waste piece of cloth that he can just put around it and then continue about his daily work. Like that was, it was just a, a non-eventful thing. So, but this was something that happened just because of my curiosity, just follow my garbage once to see where it goes. And once you start taking that first step to see, you know, what is the problem, right? You, you can just land in a completely different place where you feel that you knew everything about it. And that's why you just normalized not asking questions. But once you start asking questions, you're just like, oh man, this goes really, really, really deep, right? So it's, it's all about what catches your eye and there may be 10,000 things like, but essentially just do something about it. Don't be an armchair intellectual. And this was, huh. So when all this was happening, like what triggered the US thing in your mind and doing yeah. an MBA? Yeah, Explain. that's something that, um, you know, is, it's an interesting part of the journey, right? Like, because um, I feel I stumbled across this amazing group of people and this amazing mission in India, you know, while I was working there. But it's something that, you know, especially when you're in your 20s, and you find 
you know, yourself in a place which is so profound, there's definitely a question that one asks themselves as to, all right, like a lot of it is tied to identity as well as to, you know, I can see, I can foresee the rest of my life working on this issue. And I know that this issue is so complex that I don't think I will, like this issue is not going to get sorted in my lifetime. So it's basically trying to understand what else is there, right? Like, and with, it was just as a second thing for me to really see, yes, if I really am passionate about this, I will be passionate about this, um, you know, irrespective of now, two years later, five years later, and this problem is not going to go away. But there were so many things about the way the world works that I was not aware of that time. Um, and it was more out of curiosity for that and it was just inspired by more learning and, you know, trying to put myself in a very different scenario. Um, you know, the first person in my, you know, immediate family, in fact, you know, my dad himself is from a village background, um, you know, and um, he was the first migrant into a city and he built the first toilet in his own village, right? So, and this was in the 1980s. So, um, it was, there was just definitely something inside me, which was um, compelling me to go far farther. And I have always thought of human lives um, as, you know, do you know the story of salmons, like the salmon fish that people eat? Salmon, salmons. But so I know what they are, but I so the story uh, of the story. Story. Yeah. know what salmon is. Yeah. yeah. So salmons. Um, they lay their egg on top of a river stream, you know, in a very specific stream. And as, of course, the stream flows down. So by the time the salmon egg reaches the ocean, it has become a salmon. And the salmon then basically, once it's in the ocean, starts a journey back up the same river stream that it came from. But this only this journey back up the same river stream only starts once the salmon has reached the ocean. And then through all of the, uh, you know, there are bears in the middle who are you know, eating half the salmon who are going and swimming upstream to go back to where they started from. And a few of the salmon who started from that specific and they have like very acute sense that they know which stream that they came from and then eventually the salmon that make up to the top of that place are where they were spawned, lay their eggs, and then they just lose their willingness to die and uh, to live. And then they just die there. And that's the story of a salmon. I have always felt that, you know, it's similar to the story of human beings too. Like we want to try to see how far we can go before it's time to turn back and get to home. Right. Like, and it's basically, you know, what is your definition of home? You know, what, what, what do you, because in the end, it's one lifetime, right? Like it's, we're, we're travelers in space and time. Like we just want to have so many experiences packed into the short period, um, you know, so that we have stories to count and, you know, we have things to live by, right? Like, so it's, it's all a part of journey. It's all a part of learning itself. So, um, to answer your question, my reason to come to the US was, of course, like in my lifetime, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to go to the moon or whatever or not, but, you know, this is 12 and a half hours of time zone, afraid, uh, you know, different. So, I mean, away from where I call home. So, you know, this is, it, it was all spawned from that idea as to get more experiences. Um, there's, there's another quote by T.S. Eliot, which says, What's, what's the purpose of exploration? Is the purpose of exploration to get to a new place? No, the purpose of exploration is so that once you finally get back to where you started, you finally know where that is, right? Um, and just get the broader con context of it. So yeah, that's, that's a short answer or long answer rather, <laughs> you know, why I took this journey. Um, I know a lot more, I have learned a lot more and I, I value all the things that I let go, let, let go in the past as well. And the door is not close to, you know, getting back to them in the future. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a learning experience and really value that a lot. Absolutely, yeah. So especially when you have had so many different kind of experiences, right? Starting from an engineer to having an entrepreneurial stint and also working as a social worker. 
then doing an MBA, then working professionally in US and also doing social work in US. Right. So, uh, and this is like the final question and wherein we take two questions from the uh, audience also. So there's a friend Kushal who is working with Grab Seattle as a data scientist and is becoming aspiring to be a PM. Hmm. So um, he was asking, how do you unlearn things? So yeah, that's the question. Yeah, it's it's a great question. I, I think, you know, it's it's a constant process of letting go because, and I, I think, and that's why these questions that you're asking, they have a lot of philosophical connotations as well. Um, it's very merged with our identity, right? Like um, if you, and there is no age for this. Um, and you just have to look at people who have shown you with example as to, you know, how to unlearn. But um, essentially- Maybe from you your to... experience, you can come back, sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's more about always having that wide-eyed curiosity about things. Like, even though I may be experienced um, in Jitesh and Gagan, like I, I still strongly believe, you know, through my experiences that learning is everywhere, right? I, I can learn, you know, things from you and Gagan, like, and anyone, I, I don't feel myself as higher than anyone or better than anyone, or, you know, it's just my unique set of experiences that has led me to here, but I, I really seek learning in every single opportunity. And like, it's, it's good to be lightweight when you're traveling across like this. Um, if you are a data scientist and you want to be a PM, you know, what got you into a data scientist will not get you into a PM role, right? Other than the grit and the willpower. So how, and a lot of people find this very challenging because the status quo is, it's such a strong thing where, you know, once you have identified yourself as a data scientist, you knew how much a struggle it took to become a data scientist for Grab. A lot of times you may just feel, oh man, like, will I just have to let go of all of this? And what if I, I can't be a data scientist again? Like in that case, like, you, you just have to have a notch star as to, you know, have a better perspective as to if nothing else, like you learned something new. Right. And um, application of that, once you have across all of my different engagements as an entrepreneur, engineer, um, you know, a product manager, I really feel that I'm rich right now because of each of the individual, um, you know, unique experiences that I had. Like, I really can't let go of even a single experience um, that I, I would say was dispensable. Right. Every single experience added some value. The onus is on us to find the silver lining. The onus is on, um, you know, each time that you fail, it's, you have to realize, you know, what's my lesson here, right? And be very, very dogged about finding that lesson for yourself. You know, what are you going to modify? Because a lot of times it's, it's very easy to brush things under the carpet because it's more convenient to do that. And like not successes and failures both. And once you start getting more and more used to it, you start realizing that these are just labels that we use for ourselves, successes, failures. Like in the end, it's just learning. That's it. Like there is nothing else. Um, so yeah, I, I think just having this sort of a mindset helps you channelize yourself and focus yourself more. Um, so like for a PM, like if you really, if you're a data scientist and you really want to be a PM, talk to more PMs, talk to the people who is irrespective of whether they are junior to you, senior to you, just try to understand what really, um, you know, what skill sets do you really need and how you may need to pivot. Um, but don't just take people's advice for it. Um, reuse your own judgment, right? Like, and always have, always have the thought process, hmm, you know, maybe this works for me. This does not work for me. What works for others may not work for us. Um, so yeah, I think um, it's, and everything is cumulative. If you're a data scientist and you become a PM, you will add a significant bunch of, you know, skills that you brought as a data scientist, which may be a distinguishing factor. So rather than seeing it as a limitation, seeing it as something that enriches you, I think that's another perspective that may help people um, who are looking to make this journey. Actually, I just wanted to just again on a lighter note, put it on the record that we did not pay you or ask you to use the term North Star. I think you used it organically. <laughs> <laughs> just a bunch of times uh, yeah, yeah. i just wanted to put that on record yeah yeah <laughs> i think it's just i think uh, just very organic 
it's a good reference right like metaphors <laughs> that's 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 how we have named the podcast so oh is it i did not know that <laughs> i should have known that <laughs> i because oh. you just reached out right like and i i was just like yeah. okay gagan and but yeah sorry i i should have known that <laughs> good i mean good job you guys it. absolutely and it's it's good job for you guys because i think there is the term product manager is so new um and anything that's new has got so much of you know hype built around it um but once you get down to the weeds of it you realize that you know what like if you join with the expectation that you're only doing you know sexy and cool things then it you're going to be in for a rude shock so it's it's basically um you know a good grounding fact to really try to understand you know why you're doing this and you know what what you're getting out of it is so i mean great for um great for you guys to take this initiative and demystify some of the complex areas and you know some of the implicit biases that people have just because you know it's become a catchphrase um because in the end like when you get down to it it's just work right like and if you're passionate about the work like you you do get at it if you're not passionate about the work it gets cumbersome after a while it's just too for everything absolutely right. but great initiative guys um, and so yeah i think it it calls for great spirit to yeah, so and it's all voluntary right like that's that's absolutely. that's amazing part of it right no one your parents aren't telling you to do this your your teachers aren't telling you to do this your boss is not telling you to do this it's just something that's coming out from inside you so that deserves credit congratulations and like the best wishes for your uh, initiative the next chapter absolutely it's a great idea it's yeah. it's just there is another block pending for a while now yeah. yeah thanks for thanks for the appreciation as well thank you nice thank you Ach. all right thank have you. a good night guys bye bye you too have a good day